Hello, it is Saturday, March 2nd. You're watching news from Kazakhstan on K+. These are the headlines. The government intends to rewrite the land bill. The new version will contain no provision for a free 10 acres of land. Residents of Almaty picket near the Rheinberg Monument. Political demands voiced along with social. Rolos Respublik editor's brother Askar Maldashev is found guilty of possession but set free on four years probation. Minus 10 acres of land, the government intends to deprive citizens of their right to receive free individual land for housing development in Astana, Almaty and regional centers. The parliament made appropriate amendments to the land code. Some MPs opposed the move while politicians warned the innovation may pose a threat of social unrest to the state. Why did the cabinet decide to take this measure despite the president's promise of free land in our first report? On Friday, the head of the Land Management Committee, Katerhan Atarov, made a shocking statement while speaking at the parliament. The official proposed to stop issuing free land plots to residents of major cities of the country, since the queue has already reached almost one million people. The required 900 square kilometers of land could become available only in 80 years. That's how long it will take to install the necessary infrastructure. To prevent negative consequences in this situation, our bill proposes to abolish the law on free distribution of land for the private housing construction in Astana, Almaty and other regional centers. The document is supported by the government and approved by the president's administration. It isn't really clear what the official means by the negative consequences, but MPs were quick to come up with grim forecasts in the case of the bill's passing. Some of them said the amendments will immediately lead to skyrocketing prices and further land speculations. All the people who already have land will sell it now at increased price. This will end up just upsetting everyone. What is the benefit of the law for our regular citizens? This just reeks on redistribution, really, as land is always the issue linked to revolutions. What you're proposing now is a very serious thing. We shouldn't deal with it hastily. Gulmira Sarsimbaeva has been waiting for her plot for already 12 years. During this time dealing with paperwork, she saw three governors replace each other and became a triple grandma. In 2004, the woman decided to take the matter in her own hands and build a house in an Astana shady neighborhood on Didis, becoming a squatter. Now she can't legalize her housing while the authorities can evict the family and raise the property at any moment. The proposed bill means the end of the dream for Gulmira. What else can I do but keep on fighting for this meager plot? How did it happen that I still don't have the right to own it, being a citizen of Kazakhstan and waiting in the queue for 12 years? I'll never believe there is not enough land, as it's clearly enough for everyone but ordinary folks. The former MP of the second convocation, Sirik Balibayev, was among the seven parliamentarians who was against the land code adopted back in 2003. The politician still believes that there isn't enough land for everyone in Kazakhstan and any actual inspection will show that most plots are owned by none other but officials and authority figures. The new amendments will only lead to social explosion, says Alibayev. The land belongs to the people. If it comes to that, we need to instigate criminal cases against people who illegally settle there. The plot should be given to anyone asking for them and is ready to build housing there. The constitution says that everyone is equal. But who benefited using our land? People like Kharapunov and Nazarbayev's family. Despite the vast territory and relatively small population, the land issue remains one of the most topical in Kazakhstan. Back in 2006, it has already led to clashes between the police and residents of Almaty suburban district Shanarak. A rally against social policy was held on Friday in Almaty. The people numbering in only about two dozen picketed near the Rheinbeck statue, expressing their dissatisfaction with rising prices. Among other things, they made a number of overtly political statements. Our reporters continue with the story. We will either have a good life or we will die fighting. We have no other way. Our government, our president and heads of administrations should keep that in mind. The rally of those dissatisfied with price rise on petrol and public utilities was held on Friday in Almaty near Reimbek Monument. Around 20 people took part in the rally. Those people said no to the rise in water, electricity and gas tariffs. Besides that, rally participants spoke against political interaction of Kazakhstan and Russia within collective security treaty organization and military and technical field. 
This is just a show, as it was in Janozien, Arkan Kirgen and Aksai Gorge. This is a well-orchestrated show that will end up in bringing of Russian troops to Kazakhstan and occupation. We're against this. Bagumur should stop all that. Apart from this loud political statements, other problems were also addressed at the rally, such as obtaining citizenship for repatriates, social benefits, housing issues and pensioners. 70-year-old Rahimjan Aybolov complains that pensions in socially oriented Kazakhstan are not enough to buy food, not to mention other things. They stole all the riches of Kazakhstan. This is impossible. Those fat pigs in Astana are not doing anything for the people. Billions and billions were stolen. 23 years of independence and we're still living below poverty line. Policemen, people in civilian clothes and officials with district administration were watching the emotional speeches. An hour later, the dissenters left but promised to organize another rally on May 1st. The Agency for Regulation of Natural Monopolies announced new retail prices for diesel fuel on Friday. In March, it, was, it will be $6.5 per liter. Meanwhile, the marginal cost of gasoline will remain the same. According to a representative with the Agency on Regulating Natural Monopolies, a lot of efforts have been made to keep the price for popular gas grades 80, 92 and 93 unchanged. However, the fuel price went up. It is worth noting that the government raises the cost of diesel fuel every year, right before the start of the sowing season. However, Agency on Regulating Natural Monopolies explains the price rise by increased exports into Russia, which might create a fuel deficit in the country. The price may rise up to 67 cents per liter of diesel fuel this is the price after VAT. Yesterday's price was 62 cents per liter. I'm talking about the price of summer and interseasonal diesel oil. Randa's disabled miners are unable to get bonuses to their salaries from Arcelor Timirtau as they are entitled to. Disabled workers have fought for more than two years for their rights. Even MPs supported them and made amendments to the law. It states that every time the employer raises wages, it has to perform a recalculation and pay an allowance. However, the industrial giant ignores the court's decision and does not comply with the provision. The issue is developed up next. Miners who lost their health while working for ArcelorMittal Timetau are outraged. Disabled miners have been trained to achieve a fair treatment for several years. However, their struggle has varied success. According to them, their former employer is trying to deceive them, as it wants to avoid paying fixed premium benefits. By law, the employer must readjust benefit payments with each wage increase. He does recalculate benefit payments, but a year later, for instance, the 2011 recalculation took place only in 2012. The 2012 adjustment will be done in 2013, so each year will lose about $1,300 to $2,000. Thus, ArcelorMittal saves money, but by the law, it is supposed to recalculate payments each year. The new law on disability payments was virtually unanimously approved by all MPs and signed by the head of the state. Nevertheless, according to disabled miners, ArcelorMittal Timirtau doesn't comply with the law, and if it does, then only with violations. In addition, it ignores the court decision. Currently, I'm suing them while neither the former employer nor insurance company pay me benefits. I receive only the government-provided benefits of $152, and that's it. No, laws are not properly enforced. ArcelorMittal presents everything as if it obeys the law and does everything right. However, it does nothing of that kind. It is violating the law. For us, it is difficult to prove the correctness of the recalculation when it comes to finances and numbers, because we do not have access to this data. It is true that we received what they paid. And yes, there were some adjustments, but we cannot prove they were according to the law or not. According to disabled miners, they are not asking anything on top of what they are entitled to receive from their former employer. In total, about 3,000 people with disabilities consider themselves as cheated. Neither representatives of ArcelorMittal nor officials came to the meeting of the outraged disabled miners. Currently, former miners lost any hope for justice and do not believe that the state will ever stand up for them. The number of labor disputes in Kazakhstan remains the same. Last year, the employers and the workforce were involved in more than two dozen disputes, announced the Minister of Labor and Social Security, Sadiq Abdianov, at a roundtable in Almaty. However, panelists and journalists were more interested in the official's opinion on the reduction of benefits for pregnancies. At this point, two people, both father and minister, awoke inside Abdianov. I heard about the protest but haven't received a parcel with diapers and a diploma from the protesters. The Minister of Labor and Social Security, Sirik Abdianov, commented on reduction of benefits for pregnancy and childbirth, saying that as a father, he understands the situation, yet as a minister, he's forced to take unpopular measures. 
Let's cancel free medical care and free education. What do you say? Let's look from the perspective of this woman. She received up to $53,000 and so did others. But what about the children? Down the road, they have to go to kindergarten, schools and universities. All of the above is taken care of financially by the state these days. Independent trade unions and activists of the movement against the reduction of maternity say the employers will pick up the old practice of the 90s, which is cutting wages and layoffs during pregnancy. Ministry of Labour and Employers' Confederation suggested the activists not to make an unjustified fuss about it. The ministry representatives offer us to negotiate so that they could explain us everything. But we already heard it all before. First of all, SSIF is soon to become bankrupt allegedly because of us. And secondly, there have been cases of fraud. The International Labour Organization makes rather politically correct and careful comments regarding the social debates in Kazakhstan. In order to avoid labour conflicts, each organization should sign a collective agreement and set all solution mechanisms for sensitive issues in it. Collective agreements shall provide for everything including salary which help to avoid issues in future. The collective agreement is in fact the constitution of the enterprise or a certain sector. Nobody is protesting or striking when it is in place. International experts noted that the labor conflicts often occur in those enterprises where neither trade unions nor the employer know their labor laws. This is very common for Kazakhstan, yet the experts remain optimistic due to the fact that workers of Kazakhstan demand for their rights more often these days. The Bostandik court announced the verdict on the banned Golos Respublik newspaper publisher's brother. Askar Maldashev was found guilty of illegal acquisition, storage and transportation of drugs on a large scale without the intent to sell. The judge sentenced him to four years probation. We turn to our reporters who literally lived in court this week for more on the story. The packed courtroom eagerly awaited the verdict when Askar Maldashev was escorted into the courtroom. Finally, Judge Yelena Kwan returned with the ready decision. Askar Maldashev is found guilty in accordance with the Article 259 of Kazakhstan's Criminal Code and is sentenced to four years conditionally with a three-year probation. The sentence might be conditional, but Maldashev's family is still happy he doesn't have to spend time in jail. The attorney, though, hoped for a different ruling. I'm not happy with the verdicts. Until the last moment, I hoped that Askar Maldashev will be fully acquitted. Askar's brother Danyar rushed to tell the happy news to the rest of the family and friends. We'll go to our parents first. The most important thing right now is that he's free, even despite the probation. This time Askar takes this stance as a free man. He no longer has to worry about courtroom attendance. Maldashev recalls his days in the temporary detention facility and shares with the press what he really wants to do now. I have no regrets about the time I spent there. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. You can see that I kept my chin up. Also on February 20th, I've been a father to a son. What I want to do is to see and talk to my family and parents. All this time, the brothers tried to shield their parents of most litigation news fearing for their well-being. After all, Maldashev Sr. underwent two surgeries last year. But today the family just can't keep back tears of happiness. Askar's father Angar still has unanswered questions. One moment his son encountered problems due to publishing Golos Respublike and the next he was accused of drug possession and trafficking. Who did this to us? That person is a public enemy and the enemy of the president. After talking to the parents, Askar immediately calls his wife. I'm home already, just visited mom. How are you? How's the baby? Maldashev's family is complete again. All of them have so much to talk about and reveal that the four months of Askar's detention only made family ties stronger. It's a happy end for once and Maldashev's now see the first day of spring as a celebration of freedom. $200 for guest workers. Deputy head of the Sarajash Police Department was detained in the south of the country for bribery. The colonel was caught in the act on the streets of Shumkent. 34-year-old city resident turned to the police to report that the deputy head of the police department asking her for a bribe. In return, he allegedly promised not to cause problems for Uzbekistan citizens working in her greenhouse. The policeman was caught red-handed and a criminal case was initiated. 
Since early this year, the staff of the Internal Security Department of South Kazakhstan Regional DIA opened 18 criminal cases on their own initiative, which are being investigated. Police officers were held over these cases and all of them will be brought to justice. Disciplinary action will be also taken against their supervising officers. Also in the South, a high school director, doctor of psychology Nami Ali Yasminbetov took his own life. His family said that a few days before the tragedy, the man secretly took out a large sum of money from the house. They suggest it may have something to do with the suicide. In the morning, the 63-year-old man went out to the yard for bathroom, but later his family found him hanging in the barn. The head of the family didn't leave a suicide note. According to the family, Namiyali looked much stressed lately. The relatives do not know what bothered him and for what he spent a large amount. However, it is worth to note that he opened a daycare center at the school recently and was hoping to build another facility with the charity money. As a trained psychologist, he often used to give lectures on suicide and how to cope with depression. The incident was registered on February 27th and was classified as suicide. Enough evidences proving that were collected. Police appointed forensic medical examination. Forensic experts confirmed that it was a suicide. Therefore, we ruled out the possibility that it was a homicide because his body showed no visible signs of injury. All injuries indicate that the person has committed suicide. Sports and equal opportunity were discussed in Almaty on Friday. Paralympians paid a visit to boarding schools for children with disorders of the musculoskeletal system. In Kazakhstan, preparations for the special kind of Olympics began drawing attention 10 years ago. The next story explores the lives of those who dream of a competition in which the main thing is not to win, but to participate. Sport is a second life for Kanat. He started walking again thanks to table tennis. He's now dreaming of participating in Paralympics in Rio de Janeiro. The teenager was looking forward to meet four Paralympians who are visiting his foster home. I wasn't able to walk when I was at age three. Then I got here, I learned about this kind of sport and started training when I was at age five. I started playing and walking. Galina Vanina, state trainer for the disabled, says that it wasn't until recently that Kazakhstan started paying attention to Paralympians and realized that the country was in need of champions. There are around 150 children who have problems with musculoskeletal system. 15 of them are part of the national team. Currently, we have only one training center for Paralympians that was opened last year. It is very difficult to train Paralympians there for big achievements. Zoya Petrovna has been training disabled children for more than 10 years. Her children are eager to train and win. The problem is that children are training on their own, and in order to develop, they need to participate in international competitions. The trainer wants her children to meet Russian Paralympians. The neighboring country is experiencing a boom in Paralympics movement. Our children are taught to play this game since grade 5 and 6. By the time they are at age 9 or 10, they become professionals. When they leave school, they stop training and lose all their skills because they don't know where to practice their skills. I think this is the fault of the Paralympics committee. Their management changes all the time and I think this engages in issues that are not that serious. When he was a schoolboy, Paralympian Ravil Mansurbayev lost his arm in a car accident. Last year, he could not participate in the London Paralympics as he failed some exercises in the qualification round. However, he did participate in athletics. He has also won a silver and bronze medal in Islamic Games. Ravil says that everybody who wants to become a Paralympian has to go through a tough selection process. Unfortunately, we don't have any facilities for Paralympic athletes to train, including an appropriate sport hall and special simulators, which are really expensive and hard to find. According to official data, there are 600,000 disabled people in Kazakhstan. At the meeting with the Paralympians, the Arab countries were given as an example where the authorities support and encourage sportsmanship. In contrast, the students of this boarding school can only dream of such a chance. The Ministry of Emergency Situations units are placed on high alert due to the weather. Main highways in four regions remain closed to traffic. Roads are plagued by snowstorms, leading to almost zero visibility. Meanwhile, Almaty rescuers begin preparations for the spring. The mountains are becoming prone to avalanches. The Department of Emergency Situations spoke at the briefing in Almaty on where it is safe and unsafe for tourists to visit. 
The emergency situations department issued a warning to residents of Almaty on increased dangers of avalanches due to the spring thawing weather. During the press conference on Friday, the experts explained that they control the unstable mountain areas. This year was heavy on us due to avalanches caused by abnormal amount of snow in the mountains. Therefore, along with Chimbulak and Kassel Zashita, we've been triggering smaller avalanches as preventive actions. The rangers consider Chimbulak to be the safest area so far. The ski patrol is carefully monitoring the slope here. The rescue team went through two-year training by the Austrian expert Alexander Prokop. Yet even this oasis of snow has its issues. The challenging factor here in Chimbulak is that you have a shallow snowpack with uh, sometimes uh, not a good foundation of the snow because you have big crystals and the layer above tends to slide down. 2013 started without incidents, however the number of reckless remains the same, say the rescuers. Our tourists often underestimate the safety ignoring the warning signs and fences. They tend to drive into dangerous zones, risking both their lives and ours. In the meantime, the popular winter resort is in full swing. Most tourists say that they are trying to follow the rules. If the person is not all there, he does whatever he wants. Otherwise, there are signs everywhere you just need to follow them. I believe there are three tracks in Agbulak, and I heard about incidents in Tabagan last year. There are dangerous areas out there, but all you need to do is use your head and follow safety rules. The last casualty in this area, which occurred in March 2012, claimed the life of an alpine skiing instructor. His dead body buried under the snowslide was retrieved one and a half hours later. That is all we have time for this week. Thank you for watching. Tune in to Vlast KZ with Aslbek Abdullah on Monday. Have a great weekend.